We are now getting into the plot of the Pseudolus, and this is a diagram of the stage with all of the characters that's well worth kind of keeping open while you do the reading. And this is how the characters would have mapped onto the stage background itself. So this play comes out in 191 BCE, so right after the Second Punic War is done. Second Punic War is wrapping up in 201 BCE, so this is within, uh, yeah, this is 10 years after the end of the Second Punic War. And you can see this in the name of Calidorus' well, girlfriend, although girlfriend is a bit of a stretch. So Phoenician is the enslaved sex worker that Calidorus is after. Phoenician is one of several enslaved people owned by Balio. Balio is the pimp character. So he is an enslaver who buys people and then profits off of their sex labor. And he lives in a brothel that is next door to two families, Simo and Calipho, these two old dudes. And this is because ancient neighborhoods did not have zoning ordinances. So you could, yes, be living next to a brothel. And that was perfectly fine. Sex work was legal. Sex trafficking was legal. But legal doesn't mean that it was considered respectable. And legal has some limits. So if you are a sex trafficker like Balio, you wouldn't be allowed to give evidence in court, just like an actual sex worker. Uh, they wouldn't be allowed to give evidence in court either. So you do have some legal penalties connected with going into this kind of profession. And this is why Balio is an acceptable target for his neighbors. Like Balio is not a popular neighbor. Nobody likes him. They think that he is scuzzy which is another bit of evidence that Romans did indeed think it was super scuzzy, at least to traffic people in this way. And it's not just human sex traffickers, like people who were retailers of enslaved people were also considered disreputable. Weirdly, like buying enslaved labor, totally fine. Trafficking, bad. Interesting. So I've got folks lined up by household, and there's a key here showing who was enslaved by whom. And uh, there's one dude who doesn't live in this neighborhood, so uh, Polymachiroplogides, yeah, that's what his name is. Polymachiroplogides is this Macedonian general who's coming from out of town, and he wants to buy Calidorus' girlfriend. So there's a bidding war between this Macedonian general dude and Calidorus, who's Simo's son. So Simo's the old guy, he's got the money, Calidorus doesn't have money, his best friend has money, and Calidorus wants to get with Phoenicium. Interesting note about Phoenicium, her name is grammatically neuter. If you're familiar with Latin, you know that's a, a grammatical gender that's used for things, not people normally. There are very few Roman people's names that end in um. Phoenicium is one of them, and that's telling. It's not an accident. Her name means Phoenician thing because she's an enslaved person and enslaved people were often named for their country of origin. And the fact that Phoenician thing is someone who's being trafficked in 191 BCE in comedy Rome is a sign of the times because Rome has just conquered Carthage, a Phoenician colony, where large numbers of Phoenician identifying people are being enslaved and trafficked, including sex trafficking. So Phoenicium is a sign of the times here. And it's important to keep in mind, we never hear her speak. She's an entirely silent character. There's one point where she has written Calidorus a letter, but even then, we don't know if, did she write it? Did Balio make her write it? Is she writing it because she actually wants to be with Calidorus, or is she writing it because she'd rather be with Calidorus than this Polymachiroplogides dude? And then how many choices does she really have? The play doesn't ask these questions, by the way, which is interesting. Even within the universe of the play, some enslaved characters get more agency than others, and Phoenicium has very little, which is really depressing, isn't it? So here is that stage backdrop again, mapped against the ancient stage. So here's that center, we use, use green. So we've got center drawer, 
right door, left door. So that's what you should be imagining when you're imagining what this play would look like. So let's talk a minute about the sex trade in Rome. Uh, most of this I've already said. The bulk of sex workers in Rome were either enslaved or formerly enslaved. Those who weren't were often um, poor and homeless, although you'd sometimes have people doing sex work to supplement other kinds of incomes, especially lower income people. And this is still normal. We call this survival sex work. So if you're doing sex work because it's one of the few viable ways of making survival money allowed to you in your society, we distinguish that from sex work by free choice, which some people do. And in the ancient world, too, there were some people who, yes, did choose to do sex work because they liked doing it, because they found value in it, they were good at it. But for the most part, and here we're talking about 99.9% .9 of the people in sex work in antiquity, and I'm using people deliberately. This included intersex people, um, male-bodied people, female-bodied people, a real range of folks represented amongst sex workers in the ancient world. And we have a lot of it information about this kind of work because it was stigmatized, controversial, and very common, incredibly common. So most people get into sex work because they are being trafficked. And this was a self-perpetuating system. Because there were barriers against people who had done sex work moving into non-sex work sectors of the economy, if you had done sex work in the past, one of the only ways available to you to continue to make money would be to buy and traffic other sex workers when you became too old to be viable working for yourself. Frequently, you would be disenfranchised in a way that would make it difficult for you to save money, especially because of the slavery component to this. So regularly, you would be owned by somebody who would take the profits from your sex work, and then when you were no longer useful to them, if you didn't have the funds saved to buy your way out of the system, if you couldn't afford to support yourself on your own, if you couldn't get somebody to become your domestic partner, you would be cut loose and you'd have to make your living however you could. And a lot of homeless people living on the streets of Rome got to be there through uh, being used up and spit out in the sex trade. And part of why you wouldn't have your money saved is because you had been trafficked. You didn't get to keep that money. Frequently, you would be living in a situation where you would be monitored. And this is the case for the enslaved sex worker characters in the Pseudolus. They live in a house where their comings and goings are monitored, their correspondence is monitored. This is why we think that Balio might be making Phoenicium write that letter to Calidorus, is that Balio is trying to start a bidding war so that two guys are paying more and more money so that he can get the best price from this recently acquired sex worker from probably Carthage, Phoenicium. And that's Balio's whole business model. So if you do manage to have some money at the end of this, you might end up buying more people and re-trafficking people as a pimp yourself. Some people, though, did form domestic partnerships outside of sex work. It would have been hard to get away from, especially if people knew how you got together with the person that becomes your domestic partner. Uh, some people did marry. And we frequently see this happening, not even in the context of formal sex traffic. Keep in mind that enslaved people do not have bodily autonomy. One of the things you buy when you buy a human being is access to their body as a sexual object, not just as uh, something you can extract labor from. So it was assumed that enslaved people would be targets of sexual advances from free people. Now, it was considered illegal to have sex with someone else's enslaved person without getting their permission first. <laughs> what the? Messed up, but that's how the legal system worked. And there were also households that refrained from doing this. This doesn't mean that it was good, though. It was a regular part of what you would expect from slavery, and this is true for slavery systems in other times and places.
too, which is one of the reasons why slavery is evil. And even ancient people thought that slavery was pretty evil. But some, some enslaved people would create a situation in which the, the person who owned them would end up giving, giving them, um, granting them freedom status so that they could marry them, which is a complicated setup, right? Because in some ways, I think because we don't want to think that this is such a nightmarish situation, we're like, oh, well, they must have been in love. But we need to be really cautious about that because if someone frees you just to marry you, this doesn't mean you want to marry them. This doesn't mean that you have a free choice over whether to marry them or not. This just means that that person has changed your status a little bit so that your children with them are legitimate. This is not to say that for everyone this was always bad, but I would argue, and I think I'm pretty well justified in this, that this is not a healthy way to begin a relationship. The power dynamic is uneven and pretty messed up. In the same way that we talk about somebody, uh, say, grooming a future spouse as a much older boyfriend or girlfriend, and it's, it's questionable for all of the same reasons that un unequal power dynamics are questionable at the beginning of a relationship. We do know of some partnerships where uh, the enslaved person ends up getting married to their former enslaver and then rage quitting the relationship. We know about this. Uh, in one case, there's a Roman guy whose tombstone, he like takes her off of his tombstone. And he's like, oh my gosh, she's the worst. She left me and I'm all alone and it sucks. And I'm kind of like, I bet she'd have a really interesting story about what happened in this relationship. Uh, so there are people who do resist and there are people who do stick around and, and it's just a, a complicated landscape here that we see a lot of variation in. So what we're looking at now and why I'm talking about this is this is the inside room of one brothel. So a lot of sex workers are doing it on the streets. A lot of people are doing it from a purpose-built structure that's created so that um, sex workers can be observed by their owners slash caretakers and bouncers and such as a household. And that's what this room is. So this is in Pompeii. The, the bed is built into the walls so it can't be moved. And it's got just enough privacy so you can't see what's going on, but there's no built-in door on this room. So you would have been able to kind of hear what's going on. And in these rooms, there are some graffitos that seem to have been written by the sex workers themselves about you know, such and such, probably client is a jerk or this guy's hot or don't don't go out with this guy, he's not safe, things like that. Some very interesting graffiti. For people working on the streets, frequently they take their clients into porticos like these on the edge of the Flavian Amphitheater, the Colosseum. These little arched niches are called fornicaes, which is also the word for an oven. The Roman festival of the fornicalia, not as interesting as it sounds, it's the clean your oven festival. But we get the word fornicate because these archways looked like the archways used to make Roman ovens and they later came to be used as a synonym for like alleyways or something where you'd go and fornicate with somebody you paid to do it with you. So not a great world, the Roman sex trade, but it was pervasive. You, if you lived in an ancient city, you would have seen people being trafficked and doing sex work on a regular basis near to your house. It was a very normalized part of Roman society. So on to Roman words for sex workers. Uh, Women who worked in the sex trade were called a meritrix, which is an interesting word. It's related to the word mereo, which means to work for a living, to work for wages. And it's just the feminine form of somebody who works for their living. Which, wow, that's one way to put it. So this is a working girl is a prostitute. It's just very interesting because there are a lot of women in professions in ancient Rome who are not sex workers ever. 
So it's not that all Roman women are housewives. Elite Roman women are expected to stay inside the home, yes, but this is a kind of an interesting way of putting it. There were laws that marked the clothing choices of women in sex work from married or working women, and this was in the wearing of a colored toga. So if you look at the garment this woman is wearing, let me switch to my yellow pen for her, you can see that the hem of it is curved, and this woman's too is curved. That's because she's wearing a toga. Roman women did not wear togas. It was a man's garment, kind of like a man's business suit, was the toga. If a Roman woman was wearing a toga, especially a an orange or yellow dyed toga, so you'd use a, a saffrony, orangey yellow, kind of turmeric yellow color, color to dye your toga. And that combination of toga plus color meant that you were a sex worker. So if you were wearing this kind of outfit, you were considered to be fair game on the streets. And this was codified into Roman law. So if you sexually harassed someone and they weren't wearing this outfit, you were legally liable. But if they were wearing something that could be mistaken for this outfit, then you weren't legally liable. Oh, Roman law. Good grief, Roman law. Yeah, so this is the Roman version of, yes, but what were you wearing? Oh dear. It wasn't just women in the sex trade, though, as I've said earlier, and you can see this in the pseudolus. Oh, sorry, before I get there, some of the features we see used to restrict the income of sex workers in antiquity were brothel tokens. So often you'll see little coins that look like coins, but they've got a picture of people doing sexy things to each other. These are brothel tokens. And we think that this number on the side is either the street address or perhaps the value of the token. So you would pay the pimp, like Balio, the owner, a certain amount of money to go and use the prostitutes, and then you'd use those tokens. You know, kind of like if you go to Chuck E. Cheese and you get a bunch of coupons and you can buy stuff with the coupons. It's the same principle as just with brothel tokens. Don't give me that look. Mr. Spouse gave me a look. I gave you zero look. I was picking up the trash. Oh, okay. Thank you for picking up the trash. Um, right. That's what this is, and this is how you would keep sex workers from getting a hold of the money made off of their sex labor. Also, there, there's this pair of... These are modern flip-flops, but ancient sex workers would frequently wear a version of this where on the bottom of their shoes it would say things like sequera me, which is Latin for follow me. And then as you'd walk through ancient streets, which would be full of muck and dirt and grime and stuff, you'd make footprints so that you could you know, follow the footprints to go find your sex worker, as you do. Uh, by the way, sometimes tour guides in Italy, if they ever let you out of the country, when the plague is over. Uh, tour guides in Italy will often tell you that when Romans carve a phallic shape into the streets, it's pointing you to the next brothel. That's not a thing, actually. I thought that was a thing for a while, but it's not. Uh, this is just a regular thing that Romans will do in front of their houses, any house, because it's the Foscinum, right? So not every phallic shape is about brothels in the ancient world, just so you know. So here's what I mean by a purpose-built brothel shape. So this is taken from a quarter, the seventh quarter in Pompeii, and it includes a little latrine space at the back. Everything marked in B are rooms with little beds built in. And if you were, say, the bouncer standing at, turn to my red pen, this point, in the brothel space, you could hear what's going on in the rooms. You weren't looking directly into most of the rooms, except for maybe like these here and here. But if you needed to go in and intervene, you could. More to the point though, if anybody tried to get out of this space, they'd have to leave either through you or there's this space with a stairwell, but you'd put another guard here and you'd be able to keep this area locked down. You'll notice it's also on this crossroads space. So it's got this triangular storefront kind of shape thing going on. There's an entrance on this street and an entrance on this street, which allows people to 
sneak in a couple of different ways while still controlling the space. And this would have had um, a staircase to the top floor and maybe a top floor and all kinds of other spaces. We don't know if the workers would live full time in these downstairs stairs sleeping areas or if these were just the shop front for seeing clients and then you'd spend the rest of your time on the upper floor. Probably you'd spend most of your time on the upper floor. In Plotus regularly, there's a lot of like trying to get people's attention in the upper story windows. So that makes us think that uh, people were locked in and that's sad. So let's talk a little bit about privilege as a source of humor in the pseudolus. Uh, just to make sure we're on the same page in terms of the definition of privilege. Privilege is unearned power that you get from belonging to a class in society. So privilege can come in many forms from being in a family that has enough money that they're not worried about where money's coming from. It's being born into a family that can afford education. It's being born into a body that fits preferred uh, appearance stereotypes. So thin privilege is a thing. White privilege in modern American society. If you look like an upper class white person, you're going to get treated a little differently. That's what privilege is. And it can intersect with various kinds of identities. And this is true in Rome too. It's just that privilege looks a little bit different because the power structures are a bit different in Rome. And we can see this really starkly in Pseudolus's conversations with Calidorus. So Calidorus is implied younger than Pseudolus, but he has a lot more privilege. He's not enslaved, Pseudolus is. Calidorus is the son of a wealthy older man. So his father is still alive, his father has money. Calidorus, however, thinks he is so oppressed because his dad is so unfair and doesn't give him money to buy his sex worker girlfriend that you know, Calidorus just has so many problems and he's so sad because he can't have his girlfriend and he constantly is whining about it. And he's whining about it to the character with less privilege than he has who is enslaved and therefore has to listen to Calidorus's nonsense. And part of the humor comes from that. So Calidorus chooses to whine to a character who has none of the privileges that Calidorus is whining about. Like to Pseudolus, Calidorus is trying to get money that Pseudolus could use to buy his freedom. That money means something very different to Pseudolus than it does to Calidorus. And you can see it in Pseudolus's use of sarcasm because Pseudolus is smarter than Calidorus and he knows it. And he has that frustration that comes from knowing you're smarter than this person who is in charge of you. And you have to do what this person tells you to, but you know that you would use that money so much better. In some way, this is the major humor dynamic that we get out of shows like The Office where Michael Scott is an idiot, but he's your boss, so you have to work for him. I'm not saying that it's the same level of oppression dynamics, but it's a similar kind of oppression dynamic humor. So the meaning of money is very different, and we see this in the opening scene where Pseudolus is being super sarcastic, like, oh, yeah, let me guess, you'll die if you don't get this woman. Oh, you're so oppressed. Yes, Calidorus, you're very oppressed. Pseudolus's sarcasm illuminates the very real power dynamic that's going on here, and that's part of where the humor comes from. Calidorus's utter blindness to his own privilege, and that's funny, and it's a punch-up. There's a moment where Pseudolus jokes about how, yeah, I guess I better get you that money because if I don't get you that money, you're going to make me a citizen of Milopolis. I've got to explain this joke because it's a, a joke that's actually about a real thing that's not very funny. One of the ways that ancient enslavers would threaten their enslaved labor force was if you don't do what I tell you to, I am going to put you in a worse working environment than you're in now. And one of these common worse working environments was a mill space. 
where you would be doing heavy labor, grinding grain, constantly inhaling grain dust, which is actively harmful to your lungs and makes you sicker faster. And you're also in an enclosed area with other workers, which is bad for your health. So working in a mill is hazardous to your health, difficult labor, unpleasant, and you would regularly be physically beaten if you didn't labor hard enough. So this joke about Millopolis is funny because it's true and it's actually not funny, but it's one of the ways that Plautus is able to talk about what it's like to be enslaved is by making it kind of funny. He's talking about it in a more real way than a lot of other ancient authors do. One of the few ways you can truth tell is by joking about the truth which makes humor one of the frontiers for speaking truth to power because it does provide a little bit of protection there and that's an interesting thing to look out for in the pseudolus so another thing that we see in the pseudolus is using greekness as a way to get around this truth telling so part of how Plautus can get away with putting this stuff on stage is by saying, oh, my characters are all Greek. They've got Greek names. They're living in a fictionalized Athenian city. It's like, they're not Roman. Oh yeah, they're talking about the forum, but that's just because they're, I'm translating it. So this lets Pl Plautus get away with you know, saying, oh, these, these aren't slaves of Roman people. These are Greek slaves, and by Greek people, Greek people, you know, they're not as good as enslaving people. So no, no, this isn't a problem our enslaved people have. This is a Greek problem. Ha ha, Greeks, they're funny. So he's using foreignness as a way of covering up the truth telling he's doing about Rome. Similarly, when he makes fun of a general, he's very careful to say, oh, that's a Macedonian general. He's not making fun of a Roman general. Oh no, Roman generals are never like this, but oh, it's a Macedonian general. It's a, a, Romans fight Macedonian generals. Ha ha, Macedonian generals are funny, even though all of the humor for Macedonian generals would work for a Roman general, because the things they're making fun of are things that are commonly seen out of people who have an important war-related job, right? Bragging about their campaigns, talking about how awesome they are and how badass they are. This isn't stuff that's Macedon-specific. But by making this character Macedonian, he's got plausible deniability. Similarly, even though these are supposed to be Athenians, they talk like Romans. They talk about pietas. That's a Roman virtue. They're talking about Roman legions. Like when they talk about the army, they call it a legion, not an, a poem. A, they don't call the general a polemark. They don't use Greek words for their phalanx. They, they call it a legion. But because they're Athenian, Plautus has deniability. Another thing that we'll see here is the tension around luxuria. So Balio, part of the benefit he gets from trafficking in enslaved sex labor is he has money. He has money to spend on nice oils and baths and perfumes and he's wearing designer labels and his clothing is nice and other characters are like oh my god Balio you are wasting your money on frivolous luxury items and Balio's damn right I am because I am a pimp and I am evil and I have dirty money isn't it nice. And that's part of the humor there, is that he's pimpin' and pimpin' makes you money. And it's really sad that that's still a relatable joke. Finally, there's also privilege and power dynamics between older people and younger people. A part of what Calidorus is making fun of in his father has to do with the privilege older people have over younger people. like. Older people have the same desires as the younger characters here. Like, Calidorus's dad also likes pretty young women and spending money on them, and he's also interested in buying some sex labor. But because he's older and it's his money now and he's the father, it's somehow okay. But when Calidorus wants to spend money on sex workers and parties and luxuries, it's bad. So some of what Calidorus is pointing out is a legitimate gripe about ageist power dynamics, but a lot of it is whiny privilege humor. Calidorus is whiny. I'm not his biggest fan, honestly. 
An interesting side note that we see in the Pseudolus is a moment where the, the playwright describes the physical features of Pseudolus. And this is one of the few moments where we see the kinds of stereotypes Romans are imagining when they're imagining an archetypal enslaved person. So he's got red hair, a pot belly, thick calves, dark complexion, large head, bug eyed, ruddy face, and absolutely enormous feet. So these are all body features that Romans find hilarious, but are also tied to labor and the labor markets of the first century. So enormous feet has to do with beauty norms around feet, but also flat feet where you've lifted too, have too many heavy things or been on your feet too much and so your feet get flat is a thing that happens when you're doing heavy labor. So that is a visible marker of being made to labor heavily that you can look for when you're looking for an enslaved person. And the, the dark complexion, ruddy face thing, the idea that this is somebody with a big tan, but they've also got this really red sort of face, like they're sunburnt kind of. And this this isn't a comment on base melanin level. This is a comment on how much time you spent in the sun and how much control you have over your sun exposure. There's more, so this is somebody who's been doing heavy outside labor. And the red hair thing even is something that was associated with foreigners, both foreigners from Northern Europe, but most especially foreigners from North Africa. One of the largest populations with frequencies of the, the red hair gene mutation in the world still are the Berber peoples of North Africa. So not all redheads are people that would be white presenting to us. Red hair comes in all human populations. It's a thing that the human genome just does sometimes. And in the ancient world, red hair wasn't associated with Scandinavia necessarily. They did know that people from the far north often had red hair, but also they associated it with uh, inland North Africa, because it's a common thing that you saw in North African populations, regardless of skin tone and color. And this is still a common thing that we see in the modern genetics of Berber peoples in North Africa. Let's see, anything else here? Ah, uh, yes, so kind of the, the thick pot-bellied body is an ancient version of fat phobia. The idea that a dude with a pot belly is not a handsome guy. There were norms about what ideal body types were, and one of them revolved around pot bellies. And it's interesting that we're trying to make this enslaved character have all of the traits that are considered unpretty but also funny. This is still something comedy does. Comedy is a genre where people with non-normative body types are considered funnier, particularly people who are fatter. We tend to think of fatness as being somehow inherently funny still, which is a, an interesting thing that we should sit with and unpack a little bit like. Why? Why is that one of the few places where we see body type diversity in our cinema? And why is it that that's funny? I don't have an answer for that. I just think it's an interesting question. Okay. So this is a slide I'm not going to read out to you, but it's worth looking at again. So these are some specific lines from the play that illustrate Pseudolus doing a thing called breaking the fourth wall. So this is when a character in a play acknowledges that the audience is there. Normally, actors on the stage pretend that the theater has four walls, and one of the walls is the invisible one across the front of the stage. So the characters in the play will pretend that they can't see the audience. So when a character turns around and talks to the audience, that's called breaking the fourth wall. That's the actor acknowledging that they're being watched and creating a relationship. In comedy, this happens a lot more frequently than it does in other genres because it breaks a rule and rule breaking is funny because it makes you uncomfortable so you laugh. But also it allows one character to establish a close relationship with the audience. And it's interesting that the character who does it in Plotus's plays and in old, or new comedy rather, 
is the enslaved character, Pseudolus. So Pseudolus is able to talk to the audience and bring him into their world. He confides in the audience. He confesses to the audience. He tells the audience what his thought process is. And because of this, there's an intimacy created between the audience and the Pseudolus. We're not supposed to sympathize with Pseudolus's owners or Balio the pimp or any of the sex workers. We're supposed to root for Pseudolus. We'd be like, oh yeah, you're smart. You're talking to us. You're acknowledging us. Yes, you are the person I'm going to root for in this play. I identify with you. Your problems are relatable. And that's interesting because he is playing with some things that Romans are raised to think are super objectionable. In fact, a lot of Romans didn't like comedy for this very reason, that it allegedly encouraged enslaved people to get above their status. Just one reason to love it. This is a, a bit of a riff off the Saturnalian space in which the play occurs, right? This is a special space where it's suddenly okay to do things that aren't normally okay. And defenders of comedy would point this out that like, you know, look, it's just funny, okay? It's just comedy, it's not real life, it's just entertainment. That means that it's okay for stuff to happen that wouldn't be okay in real life. And yeah, that's one of the strengths of comedy, but also one of the problems with comedy. So at the at the front of the play, the very first thing this, the narrator does to us is say, oh, you better get up and stretch because Plautus is coming and he's, his plays are long. And so already we're building intimacy with the audience at the expense of the playwright, which is interesting because Plautus wrote the joke. So he's making fun of himself first and foremost which is not to be underestimated as a tool for allowing people to go with you on your transgressive jokes. If the first person you make fun of is yourself, you're starting off with a punch down, but also like an acceptable punch down because you're allowed to punch yourself. That's you. You have you autonomy. So this is a disarming move and one you still see in modern comedy. And then he goes on to say, at, at, so the pseudolist character says to the audience now, to all citizens, I hereby decree. So he's using the language, not of enslaved people, but of the Roman government, right? This is Roman government announcement speak. So he's doing this like a PSA. And he's saying, this is your official warning, your first and final warning, namely, don't trust me, I am untrustworthy. Which is funny because he's telling you and he's untrustworthy so can we trust him when he says he's untrust that's where the humor comes from but it's also a moment where plotus is saying okay audience i know what i'm doing yeah i know the situation is ridiculous just go with this this is a special space and then this character keeps doing this he keeps reminding the audience hey you're watching a play and then occasionally he'll turn to other actors on the stage and be like look guys Need I remind you? We're in a play right now, okay? We're in a play. Look, audience, here, play. Ah! And this, what we call meta theater. So, meta theater and meta humor is humor that comes from a shared recognition between the audience and the play that the play is breaking the rules the audience is expecting. And when you get that kind of humor, you're being let in to this in-group that understands the humor. So it's a way of building trust and solidarity, weirdly, by saying, don't trust me. So, Roman culture note. When Romans were writing letters and notes to each other, they didn't use paper. Uh, papyrus, wood pulp paper, parchment, that was for more permanent books. When you were just writing a note, you didn't use scratch paper. That was too expensive. Rather, you would use a piece of wood with wax on it called a tablet. And that's what Phoenician's note at the beginning of the play is written on. So here is an ancient person showing off his tablet there. And then here we're looking at an actual surviving tablet with somebody's Greek homework written on it. These tablets were bound together like a book. And you when you'd finished writing your letter you'd seal it i'll explain how in a minute the advantage of these tablets were that you could correct 
your writing uh, by smushing it with the back end of the stylus. So you'd write with the pointy end here and this flat end like a spatula, you would press into the wax and that's how you would do erasures. And what this meant is that you could tell when somebody had erased a letter because the wax would be smushed down in that place. And this meant that there were security features to this. You could tell if somebody had tampered with the text because the wax would be smushed up where the spelling had been changed. And this meant that you'd use this for communications, official documents, records keeping, and also legal papers weren't actually papers, they were legal tablets. So when you were, if you were trying to fit like lots of words on it, then then you would just kind of squish your letters together and they'd be hard to read, which is part of what Pseudolus is teasing Calidorus for when he's reading the letters. Like you, the, these letters are all smushed up against each other. It's like the letters are humping each other so close together. The sand writing is horrible. What you should be imagining is this wax that somebody has like chicken scratched all over. When you'd finished your tablet, especially if it was a legal document or a private communication, then you would seal it. This particular tablet configuration at the bottom is a legal tablet configuration. So this outside leaf here is what you'd put your label on. So you'd say like, contract for services on July 4th, 1776, or whatever date it was, witnessed by this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this lady, this person, you know, sealed on this date, um, for your eyes only, blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you, so you didn't have to open the whole thing to see what was in it. But on the inside would be like the deed to your house or your camel or whatever it was. Or it would be your will or a letter to your girlfriend. And then you take a piece of string and you would tie it around the actual letter, which would be written on the inside of these two leaves here. Then you tie a string around the middle in this groove. And then you take hot wax, you would melt it into a blob, and then you would stick your signet ring into it. So this is an actual ancient Roman signet. Often it would be on a ring so you could carry it around. And these gemstones, like this carnelian here, were cut with hand-drawn art. And there are a few normal things that you'd put on this, like you know, griffins, Augustus used a griffin, um, wolves, eagles. Some cheeky people like to put, you know, sexy pictures on it too, just depending on what kind of person you were. But because it was hand-carved, even if you had the same thing on your ring, it wouldn't be carved with exactly the same lines. So only one ring would fit into the impression left in the wax, the ring of the person who sealed it. So you could check the password protection by fitting the ring into the seal. And you could tell if it was a forgery or not if the ring didn't match up. So that's a way that you could password protect, but also show evidence of tampering in much the same way that the erasure features on the wax would show evidence of tampering. And this is how Romans did official sealed legal documents and password protection technology, which is pretty nifty. This is a passing note on Plotus' humor, something that is probably noticeable but worth pointing out because it shows up a lot better in performance than when you're just reading it. Plotus likes to have one character start a line and have one other, the other character finish it in a funny way. So for instance, like here on line 36, where Calidorus is getting really frustrated with Pseudolus, Pseudolus is getting worried because Calidorus can decide to send him to the mill or have him beaten or both. So Calidorus getting frustrated is like, oh, I wish all the gods would just, and then Pseudolus finishes the line with, oh, bless me, yes as a way of diffusing the situation. And it's funny because Calidorus kind of goes with it and Pseudolus manages to avert a threat of violence, but it's actually kind of not funny because it highlights the power dynamic there. This is something Pseudolus likes to do where the humor rests on these threats of violence that would be normal in the everyday world. And then the enslaved character will diffuse it. And it's a moment of, ah, Look at that funny, wacky character diffusing threats of beatings. Ugh, dear.
another thing that Plotus likes to do that doesn't translate as well because it's a Roman value is he plays with conventional Roman family values. For instance, Pietas, there's this one moment where Pseudolus is talking to Calidorus and they're plotting to steal money from Calidorus's father. Pietas, right, is about honoring your family, the gods and your country, not necessarily in that order. Pietas is really important to Romans. Real Romans are supposed to care very much about Pietas. But Pseudolus starts off saying, well, if no other tools around, I'm fleecing your father. Like I, And then Calidorus, as a good Roman son, we'd expect him to say, how dare you? That's my father. You don't steal money from your father. He says, oh, may the gods forever bless you. But look, out of full respect for my family duty, could you fleece my mother too? And that's funny because it's not what we expect out of Calidorus the good son. He's being a bad son and he's doubling down on being a bad son. And he seems to kind of like not completely get it either. So by laughing at this moment, we are reinforcing a common understanding of Pietas, but we're also laughing at somebody who's like, ha ha Pietas. Yeah, no, I'm not doing that because transgressive people funny, they're good for escapism, they help us diffuse the tension we feel every day as Romans from the pressure to please our family and our gods and our country all at the same time. Good luck with that because there's a civil war on every week. That's a lot of pressure. And moments like this, you can see Plotus struggling with the tension between Roman family values and Roman family reality, where frequently you are feeling a little oppressed by the system, like Calidorus is here. But ultimately, Plotus's point is not that we need to change the system. Like, Calidorus is using his undercutting of his father's power for a really stupid reason. Like, stealing your dad's money so that you can buy your girlfriend is... Not something the audience is supposed to be like, yes, yes, we should make a new law allowing sons to do this. This reinforces, ultimately, the power dynamics of Roman culture. This is like, yeah, if we gave young people money, they just blow it all on hookers and blow. So we need to keep a hold of the money and the father has to be in charge of the family because this is where it would go if not. So, yeah, it's funny because it's flouting tradition, but ultimately the plot puts tradition right back, much like the Saturnalia eventually puts everything back where they found it once the pressure valve has been released. There's another moment that's even more complicated where Calidorus, now Calidorus, the guy who's plotting to steal his dad's money and his mom's money somehow, turns to Balio the pimp and he's trying to shame the pimp into letting him buy his girlfriend, where he's like, you you father and mother beater. And then Balio's like, oh, no, I actually killed my father and my mother. You, you fail to understand. I'm a pimp. I'm evil. I'm like, so evil, I killed my parents. Ha, you little boy. Where he's like, yeah, you can't hurt me with your words, you stupid little child. I know that I'm a despicable human being, and I embrace my despicableness. And Calidorus is like, you, you what? But in Balio embracing his social undesirability conversely gives him this power to not care, which is often something that modern comedy does. It, it's kind of fun sometimes to watch people who just don't care do stuff that we would never do. I find that that kind of comedy just makes me anxious myself. But for some people, that's good comedy. But it's another moment where Plotus is thumbing his nose at Pietas, where first Calidorus is a hypocrite trying to mock Balio for his lack of Pietas, and Balio is having none of it because he's like, I'm a pimp, I'm evil, perhaps you, you didn't get the memo. Also, ooh. Now, here's where this gets a bit more interesting. Pseudolus, the character, plays a lot with his social status and the way he frames his actions. 
So keeping in mind that this is a character who is enslaved and plotting to take money away from his enslavers, something that ancient people were super paranoid about and felt was really objectionable. And not only is he telling the audience about it, confessing to it, much like Balio is confessing to murdering his parents, apparently. Well, conf I, who knows whether Balio is telling the truth or not. Pseudolus says over and over again stuff like, my confidence rests on the valor of my ancestors, that I'm going to do this for the fame, I'm going to lead my legions, I'm going to have a triumph. All of this is stuff that freeborn Romans can aspire to, right? Freeborn Romans are supposed to want to march in triumph. They're supposed to want to beat their enemies in battle. They're supposed to be really proud of their ancestors. Enslaved people by Roman law did not have ancestors, at least not ancestors that were recognized by Roman law. When you were freed and given Roman citizenship, you took your last owner's name as your name, and that became your family and your ancestors. Enslaved people weren't allowed to have biological ancestors or a history. That became irrelevant when you were trafficked. So to hear an enslaved character talking about the valor of his ancestors could be taken in two ways by a Roman audience. Either they're hearing boasts like this and they're going, oh, silly enslaved person, he doesn't realize, or, oh, this is an enslaved person who isn't letting the system tell him who he is and who he isn't. This is an enslaved person who knows his own value and is willing to act like a free person. Depending on what kind of Roman audience member you are, both of these can be funny, both of these can be recognizable, and this lets Plotus have his humor on two levels. But it keeps coming back up. Pseudolus Part of what makes him a clever slave is that he's not accepting his slavery status. And this is something that if you asked a Roman, hey, is it admirable and praiseworthy to not accept your slavery status? They'd be like, oh, no, no, it's shameful. You should buy into it completely. But then also, this is what Romans find really funny and funny for complicated reasons. And it's a kind of humor that needs a little explanation because for us, this isn't so jarring. Uh, thankfully, we have ditched a lot of the stereotypes that come along with a slave owning society. But I don't know, maybe we aren't so divorced from this as we might like to think. At any rate, these are interesting moments that historians of Roman culture look at when they're trying to figure out what is Plotus trying to do? Does he want us to sympathize with Pseudolus? Are we supposed to think Pseudolus is actually brave or is this meant to be like self-delusional bravery? I would tend to argue, yes, all of those, because humor is funny to different people for different reasons. Now there's this really interesting moment about midway through the play. It's interesting and also very confusing, so I'm going to bring it up here so you know what's going on. There's this one moment where Pseudolus decides that he needs his own clever slave because he can't be the clever slave for himself because his mark already knows who he is, so he's like, oh, okay, I need to get my own clever slave. So there's this play within a play moment where he takes um, Simia, this other slave whose name means little monkey, like we get Simeon from it, not to be confused with Simo, the old guy. So he gets Simia to pretend to be the soldier's slave and then has him deliver a fake letter to the pimp. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a really odd moment, but it's meant to be funny, I think. Because the audience knows about the clever slave archetype, right? They know this character. They've seen this character before. It's very normalized. So when he's like, you know what I need? I need my own clever slave. They're like, ha ha, the slave needs a slave. But also, this is another moment where Pseudolus is breaking the patterns of his status a little bit. Uh, interestingly, Enslaved people were often managers of other enslaved people, so there was a hierarchical structure within slavery that this mirrors a little bit. So it's sort of a thing. So finally, this play ends, as I mentioned earlier, with this really interesting moment where Pseudolus turns to Simo 
whom he's just stolen money from and undermined in a particularly heinous way, and then invites him out to go have a drink. And this is the same person who has threatened him with sending him to the mills and hard labor and beatings and so on and so forth. And this is the moment where the Saturnalia ends. So when they go to have a drink with each other, part of how this works, this may seem like an overly rosy ending to this play, but it's meant to restore the structure that the play has been undermining the entire time so that uh, Plotus can leave the play and be like, oh yes, I was just joking. I'm, I'm not undercutting slavery. Oh no. Because Plotus, is, or Pseudolus rather, isn't getting punished for what he's done during the play, but he's also not getting rewarded with freedom. Like he's not using the money for himself. He ultimately used the money to benefit one of the people who enslaved him. So in some ways, Pseudolus has preserved the social order even as he's been undermining it. And then Simo, by agreeing to kind of go along with this situation, to a certain degree, he's he's sanctioning Pseudolus's activity, but he's also making it clear that he's in charge, that he chooses not to punish Pseudolus. He still owns Pseudolus. Nothing has changed in this play, and they're still going out for a drink together, so uh, there's been no long-term shifting in these characters' plot arcs. Even for the young man, he's there's nothing said about freeing Finicium. There's nothing said about marrying her. He buys her. He purchases her with money, and now he owns her, not the pimp. So she's still enslaved. Pseudolus is still enslaved. All of the owner class people have what they want. And the only person who's really benefited from this whole thing is Balio, who now has more money. And I guess the Macedonian general does lose out on the thing. So there's that. But I guess that's funny because the Romans are like, haha, Macedonian generals are idiots. And it's a, for me at least, a difficult ending to the play. But I think this is how this play gets away with what it gets away with, is that there is no structural change at the end, but in some ways, yeah, there has been change. We've been made to sympathize with an enslaved character and root for him and to hope that he's able to trick his owners out of money. It was for reasons like this that opponents of Roman comedy were really against this kind of um, Greek and Latin crossover thing. Uh, Cato the Elder, very much not a fan of this. And a lot of other conservative Romans thought that this was horrible too, that it encouraged the youths to not be so respectable and Romany and it encouraged people spending money on stuff they shouldn't spend money on, and it was too nice to Greek people. All kinds of things that Romans found really objectionable about this genre. But this was a minority. Romans loved this stuff. And Plotus himself became a bit of a superstar. He was one of the acknowledged masters of the genre. And that's one of the reasons why we still have him at all. Especially considering how early an author he is. Like, we have barely any other authors from this period in Roman literature. He is the earliest. Generations of Romans thought this play was so good that they kept putting it on and putting it on, which is how it survived long enough to be in the anthology that ends up in the Ambrosian Palimpsest. So in many ways, Plotus won the long game here. What I do see here, and what's really interesting to think about, is that comedy allows Romans a space where they can directly confront and think about the inequalities and unfair features of their society that normally it's not safe to talk about. Because to talk about these inequalities in a serious fashion is to come to conclusions that are going to make you have to choose morality over money. 
And uh, for many Romans, this was a survival question. They felt like they had to be the oppressor, otherwise somebody else would oppress them, which was kind of the world they lived in. Uh, Romans were so aggressive in part because they were afraid of being conquered. But when you react to the world from a place of fear, from a place where you need to conquer in order to feel safe, you're opening yourself up for a really toxic worldview. And that's where I'm left with Pseudolus. And modern comedy, too. One of the reasons I love comedy is that it lets us deal with this stuff. In a perfect world, it would help us deal with it in a way that creates lasting change. But at its very base, comedy allows a space where we can um, begin to experience empathy for people that we're afraid to empathize with. And it allows us to spend some time with our own fear of other people treating us the way we treat other people. And on that note, I leave you with the problematic humor of the pseudolus. Here ends the material for quiz two also. So take care, enjoy your studying, have a lovely spring break, and I will see y'all on the flip side. Ciao.